Hi. Hey, Meg. Good to see How you. How are you? Fine. And you? Good. Thanks for coming. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Do you want to give your slide to test? Yeah, that would be great. Um, Um, looks good. Is, looks good, and it's just yeah. the slides, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, let me just make sure these are moving. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. How's everything going? Good. Oh, should I leave this up so that it's uh, up? Um, or? No, I'll just do a quick introduction of like next week's thing with the slide and then you can share. Okay, great. Yeah, how's the uh, how's the conference organizing going? Um, good. It's organized. Um, no, <laughs> this will be like a like a practice talk for you. Yeah, um, I'm excited. It's it's been nice to return to live meetings after uh, after so long. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I was a little bit rusty before giving a talk recently because I hadn't given a talk in a couple of years. Yeah. Um, I, I found the same. Are you in the medical school at BU or? In the... uh, no, I'm at the Charles River campus. So in the College of Arts and Sciences. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's, it's nice. They're really um, building up the neuroscience faculty here. There's been a lot of hiring in the last few years and um, mm -hmm. all different programs that are related to neuroscience. So, um, okay. yeah. So the session the, that you're speaking at is the GRC should be good. A lot of uh, cool topics. Yeah, it looks great. Um, I think you're, you're Craig Montel <laughs> is there. Is mm -hmm. there uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've actually ever heard him talk in person. So I'm excited uh, to have a chance to chat. And this this meeting was in Hong Kong previously, right? Is that right? Right. Yeah. Um, Ventura is not as luxurious as Hong Kong, but um, it should still be a good good meeting. Hey, I'm excited to go to California. <laughs> so, um, have you been back since you? I guess you, you must have been back since you were a student. Yeah, I've been back a couple times, but. Um, not as often as I'd like. Mm -hmm. I loved the West Coast. It was, uh, I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. The food can't be beat. Yeah, I like Boston too, but um, yeah, California is pretty amazing. Yeah, I, um, I didn't know Boston very well until I moved here. Not I don't know, six months ago. Um, but it turns out I like it a lot. It's a lovely city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did my postdoc at Whitehead. So um, I used to live in Boston. Okay, you probably know it better than I do. Where do you live? I live in Somerville. Um, okay, yeah, I lived um, in Porter Square. And then, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. So that's I sort of Davis Square. Sorry. Oh, oh, okay, nice. Yeah, right next door. <laughs> it's a nice area. 
And then you take the T or do you? I mostly drive or bike. Um, oh, but okay. Yeah, it's pretty fast uh, and the T is pretty slow, sadly. It's the orange line, I guess. Um, it would be the red to the green. Oh yeah, that's a track. Yeah. Um, what I realized when I got here is that the green is really slow. Mm. Yeah. I used to take the red line from Porter Square to Kindle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. I'm actually coming back to Boston this weekend. There's a symposium at the Whitehead. Oh, cool. What, uh, what's the topic? Um, so my postdoctoral advisor passed away a few years ago. So it's like a memorial oh. symposium slash lab reunion kind of thing. Yeah. Oh. So it should be pretty good to see everyone. Yeah. Albeit not under those good circumstances. Yeah. It's a, a sad reason to get together, but it'll be really nice, I'm sure, to get together and share stories. <laughs> hey, Tom. So, where are you? I'm curious. Uh, I'm curious. in Ireland. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 Sweet. You are a one world in about how? Oh, one month? No. Yeah, I was in London over the weekend, <laughs> and then I just came to Ireland for a week. Uh, but Japan. Japan. Uh, yeah. London, Ireland. Nice. Yeah. My wife said I, when I, I could leave China for three months, I could go anywhere I want. So I'm just trying to pack it all in before I have to go back. Right. The Golden Conference there in California, right? Yeah, right it's um oh. in two weeks. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, you should come to it. Yeah. Really wish to. Yeah, I think Shanghai is gonna lock down again soon, so you should try to get out before it's too late. <laughs> It'll be all right. I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, uh, so uh, half my crew uh, has been locked down in for for one week something. So I'm curious. My mm -hmm. well, well, my most productive postdoc. So I'm curious. How, so they have to work. So the half <laughs> crew is fine. Yeah, they can get rest. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Meg. Hi. How are you? Very good. Very good. Hi. Good. Yeah. Is Yin here yet? No? Uh, I see her. I, uh, okay. See. Oh, hey. Hey. Hi, Ying. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Do you want to yeah. try fly? Yeah. Okay. Let me try. Cool headphones. I never, never read it, uh, CIBR yet. I heard it's very specular. Specular? Yeah. <laughs> really, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, we are moving by the end of next month. Oh. Okay, let me share the screen. I visited it last time I was in Beijing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. before the lockdown. <laughs> yeah, you can see my slides, right? It's working. Yep, yep, it looks good. Great. Okay, then I will stop sharing. Thanks. Hey Mac, do, do you know so for the mosquito transgenic gene editing mosquito, they all have something in China. I just realized. So in Guangzhou, they have also seems to do the same thing in the States. They have some gene modified mosquito or something and release something in the wild. So I'm I'm, I'm, super, I'm shocked. So I, I don't know what they're up to. Maybe some similar thing in the States. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'll have to check it oh, out. Yeah. Um, it's oh. hard to keep track of the releases lately. Um, Is something released but... in California or something, right? 
Yeah, State? there oh. was. Um, there was one in Florida. There have been some in Burkina Faso. There. That's, uh, yeah. yeah, definitely a different avenue than I am going, and it seems to be speeding mm -hmm. up. Um, oh. so we'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's like it's it's fine, like, right? hmm? It seems like it's the beginning of a science fiction movie. It does. But when we were states, we never worry about mosquito. It's not a big issue. But in China, it does. We have a lot of mosquito killer in summer. Otherwise, it's gonna kill us. <laughs> and say that it's not, especially in California, maybe it's not very humid. Yeah, it's not. It's definitely not as bad in the U.S. as in yeah. many places. But there are uh -huh. um, a few mosquito-borne diseases here, and and oh, okay. some do spread uh, to the okay. warmer regions of the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see how it works. Whether the mosquito gotta evolve himself as <laughs> against the thing eating or not. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the question. Yeah, they're pretty good at evolving. Um, so the malaria mosquitoes are actually they're usually night biting, and they've been evolving a daytime preference oh, to okay. um, avoid bed nets that are insecticide yeah. treated. They are really great at doing what they yeah. do. We just add some evolution pressure on there, right? I think it will be still be there in some other way. Yeah, mm -hmm. but we'll keep coming up with things. I hope. Hi, Jen. Yeah. You locked it down? <laughs> oh, in your office? So not, yet, not yet, not yet. Oh, uh, not yet. Half my, half my crew is being locked down uh, uh -oh. at home for, for a week, something. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Aaron? Hi. All good? Everything good. I'm in Ireland today. You're in Ireland today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, you're uh, wait, uh, wait a minute. Japan, what, what time London. is it over there? <laughs> oh, is yeah, um, midnight, yeah, 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 middle of the night. Yeah, how long you'll be there? Yeah. Uh, a few days, uh, till Friday. All right, okay. How's the weather there? Great. No, the one the one I am in London, right? <laughs> yeah. But you have to be oh, back bad. in uh, in time for your Gordon conference. <laughs> yes. Yes. So we get it started, Aaron. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to another week of NeuroZoom, uh, broadcasting from Ireland this week, and good to see everyone. And we we'll have two great talks coming up. Um, but let me just advertise next week's talks. We have uh, June Shah from HKUST talking about synapse formation and Chaining Su from UCSD uh, talking about um, olfactory processing. So please tune in next week. Keep letting me and Zalong know if you'd like to present your work. We have, we have lots of slots coming up. Okay, so now it's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Meg Younger. Um, she's an assistant professor at uh, in the Department uh, of Biology in um, Boston University. She received her undergraduate degree at NYU, then uh, did a PhD at UCSF with uh, Gray Davis. Um, here she um, did a four genetic screen in Drosophila to find regulators of homeostatic plasticity, but not just any old for genetic screening. She used um, electrophysiology where she actually recorded from the neuromuscular junction um, of mutants to find, um, to find ones with defects. This is a technique pioneered by Greg Davis and Deanne Dickman. And uh, she used this to great effect and discovered um, an ENAC channel that's um, important for this. 
Um, she then, um, for her postdoctoral fellowship, she continued studying insects, but now uh, the mosquito. She developed uh, a brain atlas of mosquito using um, whole brain serial section electron microscopy and made a resource for the community. Um, and then she's been studying, um, and what she'll talk to us about today is how mosquitoes um, detect and encode human odors and how um, this is what causes them to bite us and the sexual dimorphism of, of that. Um, she, I think she'll tell us, she discovered um, sort of a somewhat or a, a dramatically different principle of, on which the olfactory sensory neuron systems are encoded and organized in mosquitoes compared um, to, to previous models. Uh, she has received many awards. She was a Jane Coffin Childs postdoctoral fellow. And uh, she was just recently as an assistant professor named a Searle scholar and got a Klingenstein fellowship. So uh, really excited to hear um, Meg's talk. So please take it away. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Let me just uh, share the screen. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah, it looks good. Seeing, seeing what you should be seeing? Great. Um, so um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you all today about um, the work I've done on the olfactory system of this deadly creature here, the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Um, which is shown here feasting on some human blood. Um, sorry, let me just get this working. Great. Um, this isn't working. All right. So um, I work on mosquitoes for two reasons. First, because they pose a major threat to public health. And second, because um, they're a particularly interesting organism in which to study olfaction. Their behavior is driven by smell and they can be considered olfactory specialists that spend most of their lives in search of a human blood meal. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll also think that they have something to add to the study of olfaction that's primarily focused on model species. So I conducted the work that I'm going to tell you about today as a postdoc in Leslie Vossall's lab, and I started my independent lab uh, this past January at Boston University. So I began to work on mosquitoes because they kill an enormous number of people. Um, this is an infographic put together by the Gates Foundation that displays the number of people killed every year by each animal. And it highlights that the two most deadly animals on the planet are us and mosquitoes. What to do about humans is an extremely hard problem to solve, and I wouldn't know where to begin, but preventing mosquitoes from biting people and spreading diseases is something that can be done during my lifetime. And in order to do so, we need to learn as much as we can about these pervasive insects, in particular, their sensory systems and reproductive behaviors, so that we can stop them from biting people and transmitting diseases. So there are upwards of 3,000 species of mosquitoes on the planet. I study Aedes aegypti, the so-called yellow fever mosquito, which is also responsible for, for the spread of dengue and Zika. And only female mosquitoes bite, and they do this because they need a blood meal for their eggs to mature. And it's when a mosquito bites multiple people that she transmits diseases from person to person. In order to find a human to bite, mosquitoes rely on a number of sensory cues that include body heat and visual cues. I'm focused on chemosensory cues in particular because the blend that is human odor is something that distinguishes us from other warm-blooded animals. And mosquitoes that transmit the diseases that affect humans generally prefer to bite humans. So human sweat contains hundreds of chemicals and the exact composition varies from person to person. Some chemicals in the blend are attractive and some are repulsive in isolation. And while there's still a lot to learn about how this blend attracts mosquitoes, it's clear that our body odor does attract mosquitoes very well. It's been extremely difficult to prevent mosquitoes from finding and biting people. And we're still using the same mosquito repellents that were identified decades ago. 
So at the onset of this work, we knew very little about how the mosquito olfactory system works to detect human odor, but we did know a lot about how olfaction works in other animals, especially the well-studied model organisms that have been the workhorses for so much of neuroscience, the house mouse or brown mouse mus musculus, and the fruit fly or vinegar fly Drosophila melanogaster. Mice use GPCRs as olfactory receptors and flies use ion channels. However, the organization of the olfactory system in flies and mice follow very similar principles, even though they use different receptors. And the canon of ol olfaction that was established in these species is that individual olfactory sensory neurons express a single receptor type. And all neurons that express this receptor converge on the same glomerulus in the antenna lobe or olfactory bulb. Different, neuron, uh, different receptors are housed in different neurons, and these project to separate glomeruli. And then neurons from the antenna lobe or the olfactory bulb project to higher processing centers in the brain. This allows for the activation of different receptors by different odorants to be kept in separate input channels and for the combinatorial code of activation in the antenna lobe to be read out deeper in the network. So there are exceptions to this setup, such as C. elegans, but this remains the canon. It's what you'll read about in textbooks. It's the way olfaction is generally thought to work in insects, in mammals, and inferred to be the same in most organisms, including humans. So now that I've told you all the rules of olfaction, I'm going to tell you how mosquitoes break all of these rules. I'll show you today that olfaction in mosquitoes is quite different than what we expected based on the textbook. So in 80s aegypti, odors are detected by sensory neurons in hair-like structures on the antennae and the maxillary palps. And each of these structures sends direct projections to non-overlapping regions in the ipsilateral antenna lobe, which is this grape-like structure at the front of the brain. And to understand um, mosquito olfactory system, we needed a clear understanding of the olfactory anatomy. And on the way to doing this, I created mosquitobrains.org because we were lacking a reference brain for Aedes aegypti. And this is an anatomical atlas as well as a toolkit for brain registration. So here you can see the antenna lobes in blue. And I've also created higher resolution maps of individual glomeruli in the antenna lobe. And when we counted the number of glomeruli, we saw that there are 65 glomeruli in the Aedes aegypti antenna lobe. In insects, there are two main types of odorant receptors, the olfactory receptors or ORs and the ionotropic receptors or IRs. And these are both ion channels. So both ORs and IRs have obligate co-receptor subunits and a whole family of subunits that they complex with that are tuned to different ligands. ORs use the co-receptor ORCO. IRs use a few different co-receptors, IR25A, IR76B, and IR8A in Drosophila. IR25A will be the main IR co-receptor I discussed today, and ORCO and IR25A will come up a lot today as representative of these families. So these different families generally respond to different types of odorants, and if you don't spend a lot of time sniffing chemicals, these OR ligands would, broadly speaking, smell a little nicer to you. The IR ligands are, are pretty abrasive. And in Aedes aegypti, there are 117 ORs and 135 IRs. However, there are only 65 glomeruli. So there are notably more receptors in the genome than glomeruli in the antenna lobe. It's worth noting that insects can grow hundreds of glomeruli. As you can see from this example of the clonal raider ant, which has approximately 500 glomeruli to match its receptor count. So alternative possibilities do exist in nature to deal with many olfactory receptors. 
So how does the mosquito account for this mismatch in receptor to glomerulus number? The canonical organization can't support more receptors than glomeruli, which led us to ask, is it possible that mosquitoes use a non-canonical organization? And if so, there are two likely possibilities. Either multiple receptors are co-expressed in individual olfactory sensory neurons, or sensory neurons express a single receptor type, but different types co-converge on individual glomeruli, or perhaps both. And so we began to examine the system by addressing the question, are chemoreceptors segregated into separate olfactory sensory neurons? And to do this, we needed a system for cell type specific expression in Aedes aegypti, something that did not exist at the onset of this work. And so we developed a strategy to drive expression in the pattern of any gene of interest in Aedes using the Q binary system, which is similar to the GAL4 UAS system that's used so often in flies. And we generated these gene sparing knock-in lines where the QF2 transcription factor was used to drive expression of an effector gene that we introduced into the genome as well. And we generally chose something fluorescent so you could see the cells of interest. In this case, ORCO is driving GFP in the pattern of endogenous ORCO expression. So armed with the system, we asked the question, how is the olfactory system organized by looking at receptor families? We looked at ORCO and IR25A to label OR and IR expressing cells. And we were surprised to find that most glomeruli that were ORCO positive seem to also be IR25A positive, which indicated there were not dedicated OR and IR glomeruli in Aedes aegypti, suggesting these animals do not conform to the canonical organization. We then wanted to ask, is the overlap due to co-expression or co-convergence? And so we turn to the split Q system, which takes the transcription factor QF2 and splits it into its components, the activation domain and the ligand binding domain. And we use the same knock-in strategy to express these domains in the IR25A and ORCO loci. And we expect to only see fluorescence in cells where both IR25A and ORCO are co-expressed because the two parts of the split QF2 transcription factor can bind and drive transcription. And we found that there was indeed widespread co-expression of ORCO and IR25A in neurons that innervated nearly half of the antenna lobe, highlighting that this co-expression isn't an occasional occurrence, but a really common theme in the mosquito olfactory system. When we moved to the sensory periphery, we saw co-expression of ORCO and IR25A in both the antenna and the maxillary palps. And we wanted to know if this could possibly be an artifact of the genetic lines we created. So we confirmed this both by in situ hybridization for endogenous RNA and also by immunostaining. And in all cases, we saw cells that co-express ORCO and IR25A, like these here, as well as cells that express only ORCO or only IR25A. So at this point, we've seen evidence for widespread co-receptor co-expression using genetic reporter lines, immunostaining, and in-situ hybridization, which was very surprising because these families of receptors send such different types of odorants. It is worth noting, however, that chemicals falling into all of these classes are present in human odor. Because ORs and IRs generally function together with ligand-specific receptors, we next asked, is there also ligand-specific receptor co-expression? And we examined this question in a few ways. I'll tell you about one today. It was a really tricky problem to solve because there are so many receptors that are expressed and the potential combinations are vast. 
So in collaboration with Hong Ji Lee's lab at Baylor, we developed a single nucleus RNA sequencing pipeline to isolate individual nuclei, which I'll refer to as cells for simplicity. And we were able to classify these as neurons based on the expression of neuronal marker genes. And when we looked at receptor expression in these neurons, we found many cells that co-expressed ligand-specific OR and IR receptors, which you can see in this chord plot, that shows pairs of the most highly co-expressed ligand-specific receptors. Now, if we pull out cells that express a single olfactory receptor, in this case, OR47, Shown here in this heat map where each column is a cell, we saw some cells that co-express this receptor with one set of other ORs, including OR4. Other cells that co-express this receptor with a separate group of ORs that included OR82, and still others that expressed OR47 alone. And so I'm just showing one example, but we see many receptors that co-express with multiple additional sets of receptors. This is an example of an OR, but we also see this for IRs as well as OR-IR combinations. And so at this point, we'd seen evidence for widespread OR-IR co-expression of both ligand-specific and co-receptor subunits. And the last thing we wanted to ask is, are these co-expressed receptors functional? And this was again tricky because there are so many combinations and very few receptors are deorphanized. So we turned to these specific cells that we could identify in the mosquito maxillary palp called the maxillary palp B cells, which have been really well studied. B cells contain a receptor composed of ORCO OR8, and it's known that this receptor responds to the odorant one octin all. Using single nucleus RNA sequencing and RNA in situ hybridization, we found that these B cells also express the IR co-receptor IR25A in all cells, as well as other IR subunits in different subsets of B cells. We wanted to know, is there a ligand that activates the putative IR25A containing receptor? And so we looked at this in two ways. The first was using odor evoked two photon G camp imaging in the mosquito brain. And we imaged the glomerulus that's innervated by the B cells and that responded to one octin three all. And we screened for other compounds that activated this glomerulus as well. And we saw a response to a number of volatile amines, including triethylamine which was intriguing because volatile amines have been shown to be IR ligands in Drosophila flies, and amines are also present in human odor. Because glomeruli receive inputs from many olfactory sensory neurons, we really wanted to look at individual sensory neurons. So we turned to a type of extracellular recording where you can capture responses of individual neurons from a single sensory hair. And the amplitude of the spike correlates with the size of the neuron. I really want you to try and ignore these large A cell spikes and focus on the smaller B cell spikes that fire after one octin three all presentation. And this is a big ask because we all really want to look at the A cell spikes. I know I want to look at the A cell spikes, but ignore them, please, and try to focus on those small B cell spikes. So the B cell response to one octin three all is not dependent on IR25A, but these small spikes are abolished in the orco mutant. And this is consistent with what we thought about um, orco being the receptor for one octin three all. So when we looked at B cell responses to the amines that we'd identified, we saw that there were small B cell responses to two amines, triethylamine and hexylamine. And we wanted to know, is this response dependent on IR25A? And we saw that most IR25A mutant neurons lost their response to both amines entirely. So all that's left are these large spikes, but the small B cell spikes are gone. A few, however, did not. They robustly responded to amines. 
When we quantified these data, we saw there were two clear populations of IR25A mutant neurons. The vast majority of IR25A mutants did not respond to either amine any more strongly than they responded to a water control. But a small fraction responded to both amines even more strongly than the wild type neurons did. So we've seen that one octin three all acts on an OR, and in the same neurons, volatile amines often act through IR25A. We've also seen that some cells retain the response to amines in the absence of IR25A. And since some of these B cells also co-express the co-receptor IR76B, we hypothesize that the function of this alternate co-receptor is only revealed in the IR25A mutant. However, this remains to be tested. So today I've presented evidence for a functional role of multiple receptors from two different families that are co-expressed in a single cell type in the maxillary palp. But I hope that if I leave you with one point from today, it's that there's widespread receptor co-expression throughout the antenna and the maxillary palp in Aedes aegypti, and that there is a ton to learn about both expression and odor coding in this non-canonical olfactory system, including how olfactory information is processed downstream of sensory neurons in the central nervous system. And the focus of my lab is really to understand how host seeking behavior is driven by this atypical olfactory system across levels from receptor activation by human odorants to understanding how co-expression drives sensory neuron activity, circuit activity, and ultimately behavior using the techniques I developed as a postdoc as well as others. And with that, I want to thank um, the generous foundations who are funding my growing lab. We're already a few people. I would be super excited um, to have people join at all levels. So please get in touch if this work interests you. And I'd also like to thank um, Leslie Vossall and everyone who worked on the projects that I discussed today, especially Ben Matthews, who I worked with um, on developing the Q system for use in Aedes aegypti, Margot Hurry, a talented MD-PhD student who I worked with for years on the non-canonical odor coding project, Olivia Goldman, who spearheaded the single nucleus RNA-seq project in collaboration with Hong Ji Lee's lab at Baylor, and Rickard Ignell's lab collected the electrophysiology data um, I showed today and many generous sources of funding. And thank you all for listening. With that all. Thanks so much. <laughs> Great talk, Meg. Thanks so much. We have time for questions. I, I might start. I was wondering if, um, sort of in light of your findings in Mosquito, if maybe it might be interesting to revisit the Drosophila olfactory system, and maybe there might be some co um, co receptor co expression that we hadn't noticed before. Or I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah, so I didn't have a chance to talk about this, but um, so Chris Potter's lab has recently been working on um, new methods to visualize co receptor expression in Drosophila, and they've seen evidence for co receptor co expression in Drosophila as well, um, although they're not yet sure how it relates to function. Um, but I think it'll be a really interesting avenue to keep exploring. Cool. Uh, Chi Ying? Hi, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a quick question. So for your IR25A uh, mutant, you found two populations, the responders and non-responders to ME. Um, so my question is that, have you tried the non-responder to see whether they still respond to one up to three or? They do, yes. Um, it's the... quite surprising how come the spontaneous spike disappeared. So the in the non-responders, the there are still spontaneous spikes, but there aren't um there aren't spikes that are evoked by the odorant so there's a very low level of spontaneous 
firing um, of the B cell, of the smaller B cell. Oh, so even though those B cells still uh, express uh, the occult type of uh, OR type of receptor, um, mm -hmm. but the spontaneous spine actually disappear in the, or at least gradually reduce in the IL-25A mutant. So that's very different from the fly system uh, because um, uh, uh, Karen Magnus's lab identified this kind of uh, a single neuron that you utilize uh, both OR type of receptor and IL type of receptor uh, in mm -hmm. the plus system. And but in that case, the spontaneous spike doesn't seem to uh, be affected. Yeah, so I wonder what your view on this. Um, yeah, I mean, we haven't uh, looked super closely at the effects on baseline firing um, and relating those to um, what we see uh, in co-expression, but I think it will be really interesting to, to begin to tease those things apart. Can I ask if anybody is looking at the stages beyond the glomerulus to see whether specificity could arise at the later stage, specifically looking at the projections of, for example, <coughs> the cells where one or so, so high are you? <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh... I love that question, and that's exactly what I want to do. Um, so I'm collaborating right now with Wei Chung Allen Lee at Harvard Medical School to do uh, EM volume through a mosquito brain to begin to get the wiring diagram together. Uh, we don't have the kind of genetic access people have in Drosophila to go in as easily and um, find the next level projection neurons, but um, the plans in my lab are to do some recordings from those and look at odor responses and how you transform odor responses at the periphery into the central nervous system. Great, thanks. Hey, um, Max, I have a last uh, silly question. But the, how the organization different with the canonical, non canonical? Is that possible that because the evolution of the mosquito has been limited to their, uh, their, to their, their diet uh, to the very limited uh, blood from limited species? That's why they don't have to choose a lot of wild kind of food. Is, is that possible? I'm curious about the, is that consequence or result of the evolution of the Mosquito, uh, non canonical organization of the factory system. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, thanks for, I love this question. And it's something I'm really, I'm hoping we are able to figure out in the near yeah. future now that it's possible to do work on non model species more often. So, <laughs> I mean, flies and mice are olfactory. Uh, olfactory generalists, really. And we choose model species because they're yeah. generate, you know, they're pretty easy to raise. And we may be defining really important principles of neurobiology based on a few animals that are generalists. That said, yeah. I mean, I'd love to see if there are different species throughout um, that have similar or very varied olfactory system organizations, um, but it is possible that the mosquito is a strange outlier as well. And, um, you know, the idea of this being a redundancy that allows it to specialize on human odor is, is a- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. I have to see Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Meg. Awesome talk. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So long, you're up. Okay. Um, I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker, Ying Li. So, uh, who is actually another uh, ION alumni to be continued. So, Ying has graduated a uh, bachelor's degree from uh, uh, Nanjing University. And after uh, college, she went to ION to work with uh, Zhou Lingdu, uh, work with the uh, zebrafish. 
uh, where uh, she has amazing discovery to find out the plasticity and activity and mic microglia in zebrafish. It turns out to be a, one of the few pioneering paper to uh, establish the interesting uh, in vivo rule of microglia in the zebrafish. So in 2013, uh, uh, Ling went to um, Kathleen Dulac's lab in Harvard, uh, starting a study uh, mouse with mouse as a model organism, where uh, she becomes one of the few uh, lab, uh, pioneers using the microendoscope to study the uh, neural activity uh, deep in the brain in the amygdala, how the amygdala uh, neurons respond to social behavior where she has a beautiful uh, cell paper to find out the class of the amygdala uh, neurons response to social uh, responses. Now, uh, when, when Lin come back to China, he went to Beijing to start a new uh, institute, institute. We call it the Beijing Brain Institute normally, but the complete name is C uh, Chinese Institute of Brain Research, Beijing, the CIBR. So uh, in, in her own lab, uh, he would, she would continue to focus on the social activity in the uh, neuropsychology so today, she will talk about the hyper excitable limber, limbic neuron. It presents the sexual anxiety states and the suppressed mating motivation. Welcome, Ling. Take it away. Hey. Um, thank you. Thanks for the very nice sure. introduction. You can hear me well and see my slides okay, right? Yeah, great. Okay. okay, thanks. And today I will talk about a recent unpublished work from my new lab. And so any uh, suggestions and comments will be largely appreciated. So animals respond to sex and species specific social cues by initiating a repertoire of conserved sex typical behaviors such as mating, fighting and parental care. So these behaviors have been selected and persistent throughout evolutionary history due to their contributions towards increasing survival and reproductive fitness. And conversely, impairment in social function is a prominent feature of several neuropsychiatric disorders, such as autism and schizophrenia. Therefore, it's an important question to understand the underlying neural circuits of social behaviors. So in rodents, substantial recent progress have been made in identifying different neuronal codes in the vernisal pathway that transform relevant external social cues into behavior decisions that drive different social behaviors. So on the other hand, the experience of performing these social behaviors, such as mating and fighting, can lead to long lasting changes in your circuits and social internal states, which in turn modulate future processing of sensory cues and the decisions of future social behaviors. In particular, the experience of mating or sexual experience can induce profound changes in social behaviors of both sexes. For example, previous work have shown that mating can change behavior activity from ignoring or killing the pups to a parental behavior in male mice. And females can also switch from sexual receptiveness to maternal aggression after mating. And at the neuronal level, repeated exposure, of, uh, exposure to male or female cues can increase the discrimination between opposite sex in both the hypothalamus and in the media amygdala, which can induce subsequent changes of sex typical behaviors such as mating and aggression. And my previous work as a postdoc in Catherine Gulak's lab also revealed that such discrimination between opposite sex was much more striking after sexual experience and can persistent for at least 20 days after social isolation. So all these intriguing findings raised one fundamental but unsolved question. So which neural circuits may encode this chance in sexual experience and in turn drive long lasting changes in other neural circuits? And in many species, the experience of successful mating can persistently inhibit subsequent sexual behaviors in both males and females for hours, days, or even longer. And this phenomena is important for saving energy and it also increase the reproductive fitness. And in our work, we also find that virgin male mice can typically mate with two to three receptive females in 72 hours 
before they becoming fully satiated. And while in females, the experience of only one successful mating can quickly suppress their sexual receptiveness, and then they become sexually irresponsive for at least two weeks, regardless of their fertilization states. And when we look into more details of their sexual behavior performance, we notice that the males typically began to investigate the female and then attempted to mount her within minutes, after which time the female actually play a more active role by showing either sexual receptiveness or rejecting the male. But after ejaculation, males and females typically lose their interest in sexual behavior with their readiness to display sex typical mating behavior significantly reduced, but gradually recovered in several days to weeks. However, no such phenomena was observed in mice that experienced with multiple intermissions, but no ejaculation. So this mice was separated from their partner before ejaculation. So this phenomenon suggests that ejaculation is a very critical event in driving sexual satiety states in both sexes. Then we speculated that the neurons selectively activated by ejaculation may be involved in this long lasting modifications of social internal states. And when we look into the literature, there are previous works using immune staining of C4s revealed that there are some ejaculation activated neurons presented in the brain. So they found that there are some neurons in the posterior part of the BNST and some neurons in the media amygdala and also some neurons in a part of the thalamus that are specifically activated by ejaculation in male mice, in male rats. So within all these ejaculation activated regions, we are particularly interested in the function of BNST, which is a sexually dimorphic region and recently shown to have roles in sex discrimination, stress, stress recovery, and appetitive emotions. And there are also very early literature suggests a very specific role of BNSTP that involved in regulate sexual motivation. However, this has not been systematically studied. And in 2019, Evan McCosco's lab reported a very beautiful work using single nu nuclear RNA sequencing to identify the neuronal subgroups in the whole BNST of both male and female mouse. And in their study, they revealed two sexually dimorphic neuronal clusters expressing either estrogen receptor 2 or ST18 uh, in the BNST. So following this study, and we further identified that ESR2 and ST18 are expressed in exclusive neuronal clusters in the BNST. And using uh, C4 staining, we co-labeled ESR2, ST18 with C4 activity before and after ejaculation. And we found that ESR2 neurons are very specifically activated only after ejaculation. However, no such specificity was found in the nearby ST18 neurons. So we are not the only one, the first one to uh, show interest in BNST. Actually, very beautiful work from Professor Nero Shah's lab in 2019 recorded the population neuron of BNST ex uh, expressing aromatase. And they, in their work, they found that the aromatase uh, BNST neurons show a much higher uh, responses to the female entrance rather than male entrance. And these neurons also show different activities in different mating actions. But when we look into uh, the details, we found that this aromatase contains neurons both expressing ESR2 and ST18. So therefore we wondered what might the what might be the different function of these two distinct uh, neuronal subgroups. And in our work, we first used microendoscope based calcium imaging to recording these two different neuronal subtests in both virgin males and females. And we found that BNST ESR2 neurons actually contained a large fraction of neurons selectively activated by ejaculation. And uh, some neurons also by sniffing 
but very few neurons activated by other mating actions. And this, and this phenomenon is consistent between males and females. And when we look at the BNST ST18 neurons, we found this neurons show similar amount of neurons that activated both by sniffing and by also other mating actions. And this is also consistent between males and females. Then first, we look into the details of the sniffing activated neurons in both subsets. And we've found that this uh, in, the, in the ESR2 neurons, we found that first, these two neurons show a significant response upon the entry of a female intruder. But when we look into the ESR2 neurons, we found that these neurons show very significant subsided uh, activity during late investigations and particularly after the first month. And moreover, the readiness to perform mating behavior was negatively correlated with the average size of the initial female trigger responses in ESR2, but not SD18. And this result means that it, when the a response to female response is larger at the beginning in ESR2 neurons, the mice is uh, more is less likely to display sexual behavior. So this results together suggest that the subsided BNSD uh, ESR2 neurons uh, in early, early investigation actually represent an inhibition of the internal um, inhibition of the internal intention to mate rather than simply reflecting a habituation like sensory response. However, the ST18 neurons are more reliably activated in different sniffing epochs. So next, we further investigate the difference of mating induced responses in this uh, two distinct neuronal subsets. And when we look at the ejaculation activated neurons in ESR2, a BNST ESR2 neurons, and we found that a large, a large fraction of the neurons are actually um, persistently activated for at least one minute after male-female separation. However, in the ST18 neurons, they are more reliably activated only during male or female typical mating actions. So this result suggests that the neuronal activity observed after ejaculation in ESR2 neurons does not simply reflect sensory inputs or motor actions related to ejaculation, but more likely correspond to a persistent change of internal states after successful mating, while their nearby ST18 expressing neurons may simply represent representing sex typical mating actions. Then we wondered how long this persistent activation may last in ESR2 expressing neurons. So we use the long-term assess to the population dynamics of ESR2 neurons using microendoscope imaging across these two weeks. And surprisingly, we find in both sex, the amplitude and the frequency of spontaneous calcium transients were significantly higher throughout the sexual refractory period, but gradually reduced after behavioral recovery. And this phenomenon was further confirmed using wholesale patch, patch clamp recordings in brain slides. And we found that in satiated animals, they are actually a more, a more hyper excited BNSD ESR2 neurons that display higher firing rates. And moreover, the resting member potential was also increased in sexually satiated animals, regardless of sex. And we also recorded the real base, which represents the minimal current injection required to activate a neuron. And we found that the real base is also decreased. So the, all these results suggest that the persistent activated um, or hyper excited ESR2 neurons may represent sexual satiety states in both sex. Then how necessary are these hyperexcitable uh, ESR2 neurons may contribute to the sexual satiety states? So to answer this question, we expressed a GI-coupled JAD HM4DI in the virgin mice and only inject CNO when these animals become sexually satiated. And very surprisingly, we found that 13 minutes after CNO ejection, 
the sexual behavior in both males and females can be quickly restored. And so these results together strongly indicate the persistent activation of ESR two neurons is necessary to maintain sexual satiety states in both sexes. Then we try to further examine the functional involvement of ESR2 neurons in virgin mice. So here we express a step function option with ultra high light sensitivity. So developed by Guo Ping Feng's lab at MIT. And then we perform the transcranial optical stimulation to non-invasively activate ESR2 neuron, neurons during different uh, phase, mating phases. And using wholesale recording, we found transient application of blue light can very efficiently activate uh, so expressing neurons. And this activation can be largely suppressed by transient application of orange light. And using this approach, we can induce robust expression of force in ESR2 neurons or in both left and right hemisphere. So we found when we applied optical stimulation only during the sniffing phase, and this activation can be very effectively suppressed the initiation of male typical mounting. However, when we apply this uh, stimulation only during the intermission phase, so after the mouse have initiated the first mount, we found very little effect in regulating sexual behavior. And also the male mice display a similar latency to ejaculate. So together, this results suggest that the um, activation of ESR2 neurons may preferentially suppress mating motivation in male mice only during early sniffing phase. So finally, we try to further examine the mechanism underlying this hyper excitable ESR2 neurons in sexually satiety mice. So in our wholesale recording, we noticed that negative current injection in ESR2 neurons can uh, trigger this depolarizing act activated sac voltage in ESR2 neurons, which is mainly mediated by HCN channels. And also using on a scope approach, we found HCN channels is high, are highly enriched in BNST ESR2 neurons, and particularly in males. And the application of a selected um, HCN blocker, CD7288, can significantly reduce both the size of the depolarizing set and also the firing frequency of the hyper excitable ESR2 neurons in sexually satiated mice. And also in virgin versus satiated animals, we found the size of the depolarizing sac was significantly larger in satiated male mice compared with virgin male mice. However, no such phenomenon was observed in female mice. So to further examine the functional significance of HCN channel in regulating sexual behavior, we intracranially applied a ZD or saline in both sides of the BNST. And we found that application of ZD in, an, in about one hour can significantly restore male sexual behavior in sexually satiated male mice, but not in female mice. So this result suggests HCN channel may play an essential role in regulating the hyperexcitability of uh, ASR2 neurons, in, particularly in male mice. So to give a brief summary, here we find a neural mechanism that underlying sexual experience dependent long-term modifications of so social internal states in both sex and in particular and in particular sexual satiety states. And we think this finding is in concert with the hydraulic model suggested by Corrett Lawrence over 70 years ago. So in his hydraulic model, Lawrence proposed that the accumulating in the uh, internal motivation, which is illustrated by the level of water in the tank here, is dependent on both the inlet flow and outlet flow um, representing here. And this uh, water and, and this control of water flow may provide an intrinsic impetus to perform a behavior. 
and consistent with this model, we think the ESR2, BNSD ESR2 neurons may play a very important role in controlling the outflow speed of mating motivation. So in a positive phase, transient activation of ESR2 neurons by sex relevant social cues may retard the mating process and thus prevent unnecessary sexual behavior in early investigation. However, once the performance of mating actions begin, ESR2 neurons become largely silent and then sexual motivation can be quickly accumulated in the absence of this active releasing mechanism. And when mating motivation surpasses a certain threshold, only strong activation of ESR2 neurons by the experience of ejaculation can quickly terminate sexual, mate, uh, sexual behavior by quickly release the uh, social, sexual motivation in seconds. But after ejaculation, elevated excitability of ESR2 neurons can maintain a persistent release of sexual motivation uh, in recently mated mice. And we found that HCN channel is involved in this process. And this mechanism, the, uh, the HCN channel can actually increase the excitability and regulate the plasticity in neural circuits. And this mechanism has actually been revealed in other neural circuits, such as cord, uh, prefrontal cortex and um, hippocampus and also cerebellum. So, and also uh, recently, this mechanism also revealed in hypothalamus. So we think this might be a general mechanism that regulates a persistent form of changes of internal states. So in the end, I'd like to thank the students and postdocs involved in this work. So Xiao Zhenzhou, a postdoc in her lab, performed all the Menko endoscope-based calcium imaging experiments. Graduate student Liang perform all the uh, electrophysiology results. And this work is supported by uh, four very hardworking technicians in the lab. And I'd like also to thank other members in the lab and the colleagues at Cyber. And these are all the funding supported this work. And thanks for your attention. Any suggestions will be larger appreciated. Thanks, Ying. Well, congratulations for the new discovery on, on lab. Now we are open for questions. I, I have a question. Yes. Um, so how do you measure sexual satiety in the female mice? Does it depend on male ejaculation or? Uh, sorry, I, I go over too quickly maybe about this part. Um, uh, here. So we measured uh, the, we relaxed the female mice to mate with our vasectomized uh, uh, male. And those, so these mice cannot be pregnant. And then we let them mate with one mice and give, it, give in another intruder male. So we, we measured their sexual receptiveness by after being mounted by the male, we will calculate how receptive or how much the doses this female can be displayed. Got it, okay. Mm -hmm. Hi Ying. Uh, so if I remember you quite correctly, there is another uh, group of ESR positive, ESR2 positive neuron in amygdala. Is, is that right? Uh, yes, there's uh, ESR2 neurons expressing oh. amygdala as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so was it, that, that was for uh, aggression behavior, right? Eh? Uh, oh, to, no, I, I think the, you ESR2. are yeah, talking about ESR1, that's estrogen receptor 1. Oh, so so okay, ESR1 okay, okay. is expressing in uh, ventral medial hypothalamus, medial uh, preoptic okay. area, uh, and involved mm. in mating and aggression. And no one really talked right, about right. the function of ESR2 neurons, yes. Oh, my God, great. Oh, so it's very specific. I still didn't make expressing around. Yes. BNSD. Yes. Is the only where it's cracking in red for BSD? Sorry? Yes, R2. Well, yes, R2 expression. Yeah. BNSD is a very specific region all over the brand. 
Uh, no, or, it's actually also in, uh, expressed in uh, media amygdala and MPOA as well. Oh. But uh, mm -hmm. there are much less ESR2 expressing neurons compared with ESR1 expressing neurons. Got it. Yeah. Okay, there's, there's a question in the chat. Box. Okay. Hi, Susanna. Do, do you want to ask yourself? Yeah, you can. You can unmute yourself. Ask directly. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, I was wondering how these uh, ESR two neurons in the BNSD relate to the TH neurons in the AVPE, which have also been thought to be involved in satiety. Uh, and secondarily, I was wondering how um, if there are downstream regions like the VTA that might be involved. Yeah, that's a very great question. Um, actually, I think the work you are talking about is from uh, Mark Endman, uh, as, uh, they, Mark Endman's lab. So they found the TH neurons uh, are involved in regulating sexual motivation. So when we were doing uh, a circuit studies, we found these neurons are also uh, receive very intense input uh, from the TH neurons, uh, not on, maybe not TH, but we are not sure yet, from AVPV. And these neurons also send uh, intense projection to AVPV. So we uh, we think these neurons maybe play as an upstream of the AVPV TH neurons that in regulating um, mating motivation. And actually, these neurons are all GABAergic. So this is consistent with uh, both of these findings. So yes, DNSD ESR2 neurons may uh, actually inhibit uh, TH neurons in the AVPE, AVPE then uh, suppress mating motivation. But um, this is only our hypothesis. We are doing actually acquiring more data to, to find whether it's true or not. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Downstream? Yeah, for, for, for down, downstream. Oh, oh yeah, downstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also find uh, this neurons send projections to uh, VTA. Uh, we really haven't uh, finished with um, summarizing this data yet, but yeah, it's one of the major target is also VTA. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Is there any more questions? Yeah, I'm curious. What's the previous function of the BNST? What? It seems very specific, right? It's for sexual behavior, but for previously, it's some also being implicated in some other functions of BNST. Yeah. Uh, so. There are not many work or focusing on BNST. So about social behavior, uh, the, the yeah. only one work is, uh, is from Neuro Shah's lab. They use photometry oh. to record this aromatase neurons and find uh, this. The, so the major conclusion is these neurons can discriminate between uh, sexes in, uh, in virgin mice. And also these <laughs> neurons are activated at, in different phases of mating. So, so mm -hmm. and, and our finding, uh, we actually found different subpopulations show opposite effect or, and also activity pattern uh, in this aromatase activating neurons. But there are also yeah. some other yeah. work uh, from uh, like, like I show here. Uh, so there, there are other works showing this, uh, some CCK neurons expressing neurons in the BNST. Is actually very appetitive, so um, in, in early work. So, so this is also consistent with our finding. Uh, our, our neurons also express CCK, and the ejaculation can be a very uh, rewarding process. So, um, yeah. these are the early findings. Yeah. Great. Uh, is there any more questions? Okay, no more questions. Uh, let's thanks to make and. Um, in for a great talk today. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Ying. A great talk. Yeah. Um, see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Good night, Good night, Good night, Good night. 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 Good night.